Today we examine the requirement of good faith by examining the case of Market Street Associates versus Fry. The implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing is a mandatory rule that parties will deal with each other in good faith. It's an implied obligation in every contract, meaning it does not need to be explicitly written or stated, and it can't be disclaimed. The covenant is incorporated into the Uniform Commercial Code Section 1-304, and Section 2-103 defines good faith in the case of merchants as honesty in fact and the observance of reasonable commercial standards of fair dealing in the trade. The Restatement Second, Section 205, also states that every contract imposes upon each party a duty of good faith and fair dealing in its performance and its enforcement. The case of Market Street Associates versus Fry was decided by the Seventh Circuit in 1991. The opinion's author, Judge Richard Posner, is a leading figure in the field of law and economics. The Journal of Legal Studies identified him as the most cited legal scholar of the 20th century. He is the closest thing we have today to Oliver Wendell Holmes, a Promethean scholar turned judge with seemingly unbounded capacities. The opinion, while very long, gives a detailed explanation of Judge Posner's take on the duty of good faith in contracts. J.C. Penney and General Electric Pension Trust entered into a sale and leaseback agreement. To understand the case, it's useful to understand that sale and leaseback transactions are incredibly similar to a mortgage loan, but are characterized as sale and leaseback for various tax purposes. With a loan, of course, the lender initially lends money to a borrower and the borrower then pays back the loan with smaller periodic payments. With a sale and leaseback transactions, the cash flows are identical. The effective lender, in this case, General Electric Pension Trust, initially sends the quasi-borrower, J.C. Penney, a bunch of money when GE buys the property. And then Jacques Penney effectively pays back the loan when it sends uh, its periodic rent money back to uh, the lender. At the end of the leaseback period, the quasi-borrower often can repurchase the property by paying what is similar to what would be a balloon payment if the transaction were a traditional mortgage loan. Of course, if this had been a traditional business loan, J.C. Penney would have been able to make improvements in, uh, in its property. And parties to sale and leaseback transactions often include provisions to give the renter, this effective borrower, various rights to allow the same kinds of improvement in the property without distorting the party's incentives regarding the buyback option. In this case, the contract included a provision requiring the trust to give reasonable consideration and to negotiate in good faith should J.C. Penney make requests to borrow more money for improvements to the leased property. The contract further stated that should negotiations fail, this, the negotiations to acquire this new funding, uh, J.C. Penney would be entitled to immediately buy back the property from the trust with the purchase price stipulated by a formula specified in the contract. These important provisions are in paragraph 34 of the lease. Even though the contractual formula was an attempt to capture what the value of the property would be in the future, the formula in this case failed to accurately reflect what the market price turned out to be. So at the time of this dispute, the formula price was far below the actual market price of the property. J.C. Penney later assigned its interest in the lease uh, to Market Street, which was the plaintiff and the, now the appellant. Market Street requested financing from the trust without informing the trust about the contractual terms granting Market Street an option to buy the property immediately at the formulaic price should the financing negotiations fail. The trust uh, was apparently unaware of the purchase option term in the contract. The negotiations failed. 
and Market Street attempted to exercise the purchase option at the formulaic price stipulated in the contract, which, as mentioned above, was well below the market value. After the trust refused to sell the property at that price, Market Street sued for specific performance. The district court granted summary judgment to the trust, ruling that Market Street's behavior violated a good faith contractual requirement. In the instant decision, Judge Posner, writing for the appellate panel, reversed and remanded, holding that the facts could be construed to find that Market Street behaved in good faith. Just to make sure we understand the facts of the case, what does paragraph 34 of the lease entitle the lessee to do? Which term did Market Street fail to disclose? Well, two important things. First, it allows Market Street to request that the pension trust finance the cost and expense of improving on the property. The pension fund is under a contractual obligation to consider and negotiate in good faith after it receives this request. Second, if these negotiations fails, the contract gives Market Street the option to immediately repurchase the property at a price derived from a formula specified in the contract. Market Street's alleged failure was one of non-disclosure. They did not inform the trust about the purchase option term in paragraph 34, which gave Market Street this right or option to repurchase the property should negotiations fail. Like Judge Souter in Centronics, Judge Posner emphasizes that good faith can mean different things at different stages of contracting. At the formation stage, the duty is minimized, whereas at the performance and post-contractual enforcement stage, good faith is heightened because of changed circumstances and the party's reliance. Judge Posner says, quote, before the contract is signed, the parties confront each other with a natural wariness. Neither expects the other to be particularly forthcoming, and therefore there's no deception when one is not. Afterward, the situation is different. The parties are now in a cooperative relationship, the cost of which will be considerably reduced by a measure of trust. So each lowers his guard a bit, and now silence is more apt to be deceptive. Posner sees that uh, uh, the good faith duty is equivalent to the law finding an implied or, or default condition to a contract and suggests that the goal of courts in setting these implied conditions should be, quote, to give the parties what they would have stipulated for expressly if at the time of making the contract they had had complete knowledge of the future and the cost of negotiating and adding provisions to the contract had been zero. He says that the concept of the duty of good faith like the concept of fiduciary duty, is a stab at approximating the terms the parties would have negotiated had they foreseen the circumstances uh, that have given rise to their dispute. These quotations are classic statements of what contract theorists call hypothetical default setting, setting the legal default at what the parties would have wanted. So, what would the parties have wanted? Posner suggests that the duty of good faith in this context is, quote, halfway between a fiduciary duty, the duty of utmost good faith, and the duty merely to refrain from active fraud. Despite its moralistic overtones, it's no more the injection of moral principles into contract law than the fiduciary concept itself is, unquote. The major issue is whether Market Street's duty of good faith to the trust included a duty to disclose the repurchase consequence. The courts ruled yes. Judge Posner reasoned that both Market Street and the trust might want to minimize the cost of performing the contract. The point of the doctrine of good faith is to reduce defensive expenditures, or at least in part. It seems to fit in this case, and good faith should apply. Now, you might wonder what these defensive expenditures are. Basically, these are costs that a person incurs to minimize damage to himself, uh, including the damage from making a mistake. Judge Posner uses the examples of theft 
Because of the threat of theft, people often take out insurance and install security systems or get menacing dogs. All of these are defensive expenditures. In the case of a contract, if parties did not have to negotiate in good faith, there would be a lot of investment in defensive expenditures to protect each, uh, that each party would make to protect themselves against making an, um, uh, a poorly thought out uh, agreement. Defensive expenditures are bad because they are a waste of society's resources. Removing the good faith requirement would induce more defensive expenditures because people would need to investigate whether the other party is being honest rather than taking their word for it. It would require more defensive expenditures because you'd have to make sure you weren't uh, forgetting a contractual term. It would be better if people just negotiated honestly and openly and they use the resources they would have spent on defensive expenditures uh, somewhere else. In this case, Posner characterizes the failure to disclose as sharp dealing. A, shar a sharp dealing is when a party takes advantage of a clear oversight by the opposite party. There's no social benefit to inducing sharp dealing such as this one. Having concluded that the failure to disclose the sharp dealing, which itself might be a tort, the balance of the opinion ex ex explicates the theory of post-contractual cooperation in the performance of the contract, within which good faith operates to prevent opportunistic behavior, deliberate advantage taking without justification. The bottom line is that the lessor on these facts should have disclosed the contract clause, much like a vendor should have disclosed a termite infestation. However, there's a limit to the good faith requirement. Judge Posner does not think that every contract makes a party his brother's keeper. Otherwise, mere difficulty of performance would excuse a con contracting party because the other failed to relax the terms of the contract. There's another issue in this case. Do you remember what the opinion said about whether the facts justify a summary judgment ruling against Market Street for violating a duty of good faith? The court held that no, Market Street should not lose the summary judgment motion. Interpreting the facts most favorably to Market Street, because this is a motion for summary judgment and Market Street is the non-moving party, it would be possible to conclude that Market Street did not violate its good faith obligations. So the case must be remanded so a, that a jury can decide whether Market Street violated its duty uh, by failing to disclose uh, for sharp dealing reasons. In summary, the decision in Market Street Associates versus Fry gave us a perspective on the duty of good faith in contracting. Good faith is an implied duty not to intentionally take advantage of the other party's ignorance of the terms. Somewhat surprisingly, Judge Posner finds that the law may require that a contractor remind a sophisticated party of the terms of a contract that a sophisticated party has already agreed to. Posner explained that good faith